very, very gladly, uh, Professor Sarah, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate right. you joining. And um, we're looking forward to debating your recent um, book um, on flourishing and suffering. I find it highly interesting, really interesting from my own study on sort of the causation of mental health and policing. But in, uh, in the room today, we we're all critical realists. Um, and we're all looking forward to trying to find out a bit more about, about, about your work, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> no, thank you for coming. Thanks for taking the trouble to look at the book. Yeah. No, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating book, and, and um, resonated on multiple levels reading through it. Um, but I, I kind of set four questions. I think we've all been cited to them um, about Mr. Mr. Sarah's work. So the first question was, how does the understanding of human beings as a value evaluate it? Essentially, enrich our analysis. What would what do we think about that? I'd like to go. Or, I mean, I I can I mean I can say for a start, you know, that when I'm looking at peace officers and, and how uh, they come quite poorly with, with poor mental health, they are evaluating, they are looking, comparing um, who they are up against and some of the problems, and quite clearly when they feel that that you know their integrity or shame, you know. Their dignity, as the professor Sarah talks a lot about, Thank becomes you. affected, and then um, quite clearly it can come quite poorly and quite poorly, quite quickly. Want me to come in there? Yes, please, please. Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, um, can you call me Andrew, please? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and I should say, I, I'm just going to say, I don't, I've never um, really studied anything to, anything to do with criminology, although there was one book. I do remember, and I can't, Fred, I can't remember the author, I think it was American, who had worked with prisoners, including murderers, and he said he'd never come across one who didn't feel deep shame about their whole lives, you know, not just what they'd done, but their whole lives. Um, basically, this evaluative thing, I think it's unavoidable. We can't adequately describe, objectively describe, if you like, um, what's happening in social situations um, without um, using evaluative terms. Um, so, um, you know, to, to use another a different example, not a criminological one, if a social worker says this child is being abused, they're making a claim which is simultaneously factual and, and evaluative. You can't separate the two and abuse is is an, is an evaluative term is it, that's inescapable, but it's also an empirical claim about what is happening. It could be wrong, but then any empirical claim may be turn out to be wrong. And the fact that it involves an evaluation doesn't really make it um, necessarily um, incapable of being a, an objective account. And I think the uh, perhaps I should have said it more strongly in the book. Re reading subsequently, I feel it more strongly now. But when you, the very root meaning of um, good and bad comes from living beings. That what's good for something, and as Mary Midgley says, you can't have a plant or an animal without certain things being good or bad for it. That applies to humans as well, even though unlike. Those other things, other animals, um, our evaluative relationship to the world can develop in a host of ways according to our culture and our upbringing. So that we're not only evaluated about our physical health, but about um, things that we become committed to. They matter to us, uh, our deep attachments to people and um, commitment to certain practices and causes and things. Um, so if, we, if those practices are, uh, if we're prevented from participating in those practices, as obviously prisoners are, um, then we suffer. Um, okay, so, so, so I just say to be evaluated, we can't do social science without being evaluative. We can't describe the world adequately, you know. Um, but the trouble is that the word objective has got these associations of value freedom. 
um, which is crazy, I think. Um, so the social worker who makes that evaluative judgment about the child being abused is not necessarily lacking in objectivity in the different sense of making truthful truth truth claims, truthful claims. So, um, yeah, I still hear people in seminars saying, well, I, I've got my values, so I can't be objective. And, and I think, you know, for goodness sake, you're mixing up different meanings of objective there. And it's an own goal for a start, you know, why uh, invite yourself to be dismissed. Um, but, you know, when we go, when you go to the doctors, um, apologies if you've heard this example before, but when they take your blood pressure and they give you those two numbers and maybe if you haven't read read up on that topic, um, you may you find yourself asking, is that good or bad? And they give you the two numbers. What if the doctor said, well, I can't tell you whether it's good or bad because that would compromise my objectivity. And if you then say, well, what, what should I do? What ought I to do? And the doctor then said, well, you can't deduce an ought from an is, can you? So, well, that would be totally useless. Um, but there are things which are objectively good or bad for us. And OK, when you bring in culture and all the things we become attached to and things that come to matter to us as well, it's a lot more complicated and less straightforward than that. So I, think, I just think it's unavoidable. I mean, you know, in radical social science, we use terms like oppression or racist. Well, those are simultaneously descriptive and evaluative. And we can argue about whether they're applicable to a given case or not. But it um, seems to me they're inescapable and we shouldn't apologize for them. What do you think? <laughs> So Andrew, thank you. I, I mean, I think this is very strong connotations with uh, uh, certain cul-de-sac, one might say, that um, sociology of deviance as once was. Um, subsequently, critical criminology uh, might have got into um, in 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 reacting against, if you like, a uh, um, Renaissance experimental criminology. Um, uh, seeking, if you like, to uh, discover and ground objectivity in methodological procedures like the randomised controlled trial, which is increasingly significant in uh, contemporary criminology, establishing what works, if you like, uh, in preventing crime or particular policing interventions or sentencing uh, regimes and so on and so forth, rather than posing the question, uh, what works for whom and in what context uh, and, and, and why ought it to work, you know. Um, so, but, but arguing against that, you see, is it, you do you do have the new deviancy theory, you know, uh, which was reacting against that in the late nineteen sixties, uh, which placed a uh, you know a, a great premium upon uh, regarding crime as fundamentally, which it is, of course, a a, a normative category, uh, an evaluative category. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> but then drawing the implication from that, then is is that one just if you like deconstructs that category and reveals alternative. Um, evaluations, if you like, or into alternative interpretations. You know, is violence, to, to bring this into a more contemporary debate, uh, only about physical assault? Is it about uh, emotional cruelty? Uh, it should be extended even further to talk about coercive and controlling behaviour. Um, and so, uh, but all a part of, uh, it can be presented then by sort of interpretive so, social, uh, social science, as a, as a way of undermining the kind of causal explanation which we as realists would be interested in, yeah. Uh, and and what I've uh, was been very interested in in your work, Andrew, and more generally critical realism and transposing it into criminology is to is to, if you like transcend both that sort of crass positivism of the randomised controlled trial on the one hand, but also the relativism, if you like, of the new deviancy theory and the strength of its legacy uh, right the way through through to the present. Can we, in crit critical realism, rather than na the naive realism of the, of the randomised controlled trial, the critical realism, uh, uh, acknowledge, if you like, uh, all the sets of uh, judgments, evaluative 
um, normative qualities of our, of, of our concepts, but then, as Bascar would argue, uh, uh, reach some uh, position of uh, judgmental rationality between these. You know that there is a, a value, if you like, to thinking about violence in the home not just as physical assault, but as emotional cruelty or coercive controlling behaviour, for example. Yeah. So, uh, and this is certainly well. One of the many things that I've, I've I've gained out of your work, Andrew, over the years, has helped me uh, try and make that um, transcendent move beyond uh, positivism uh, on the one hand, but also uh, uh, the new deviancy theory on the other. Which I would say, I mean, I'd open this out to other colleagues in the in, in, in the group, particularly, you know, I'd be interested to see what Corey has to say about the situation in the US, where you know that kind of aggressive experimental criminology really. Uh, uh, has, a, has, has a very strong uh, grounding um, and, and but a real provoked a real sort of paradigm war um, between interpretive and um, positivist across the social sciences, but also within criminology. But I would also be interested to see what you know, the colleagues in, in, in British criminology and other parts of the world that we've got represented here uh, this evening uh, think about that. Uh, the kids, the, 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 the if you like the continued dominance of these two paradigms, yeah, and I, so I think of what we're at and interested in is 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 uh, subverting both, <laughs> yeah, uh, the grass positivism of the randomised controlled trial, the relativism of the new deviancy theory. The former, uh, I would venture to suggest, in most British uh, criminology um, department schools where it's taught, would, wouldn't be particularly controversial, but the latter. OK, regarding the new deviancy theory as not especially critical or progressive would be very provocative, actually, very provocative, I think. So I think what you're providing us with, Andrew, and what we're trying to do here is really, really quite subversive of uh, the two dominant traditions in contemporary criminological thought. And no, no, no better thing for it. But um, what, what do others think? <laughs> um, Adam said... Um... I've used your methodological literature, Andrew, uh, since 2010, and it's been absolutely invaluable and essential for me to work through my master's and my PhD and into my early uh, career researcher um, position um, to, to use that methodological literature and to really transpose and translate some of the more impenetrable uh, critical realist philosophy into the social sciences done so, so deftly. And um, I, uh, thank you for that, and it's a it's a pleasure to be with you today in a meeting. Thank you. Um, just responding to both of you, I, I was kind of aware of the relativist response, and uh, kind of shocked by it. But I do remember it um, in the in I guess it was the seventies and eighties. Mm. Um, it has to be said that when you're talking about well-being or flourishing um, but there are many issues where we're not sure um, but so many people when you say well that there are some things we do know about flourishing and suffering there are some criteria perhaps they, they come about come up with all the different uh, the various fuzzy areas that where we're not sure or particularly with in relating to cultures that, other than the, our own and there's a very strong all or nothing fallacy or perfectionist fallacy unless we know everything about well-being and can confidently um, give verdicts on every possible case then we know nothing and we should stay away from the topic um, which is absurd and we're letting people down if we if we take that kind of line. Um, and Adam, you mentioned violence. I've actually just um, finished co-supervising an Indian student, Kosiki Sama, on her thesis on marital violence in Northeast India. And she was arguing precisely that there's psychological violence as well, that undermining, there's a spectrum and various different forms and there's a lot of adaptive preferences where people get used to and, and tell themselves that this is okay. This is what, what I should expect. It's, it's me that's um, mistaken here, not what's happening to me. So yeah, there are contestable things that's in the nature of it, um, but we should never, you know, we should never let go of it 
um, for that reason. Um, one author, and I've just got the book out here, <laughs> is um, a book from 1998, Natural Goodness by a philosopher called Philippa Foote, who uh, worked with Iris Murdoch and, and Mary Midgley, who I quote a lot in the book. And um, she says, um, an animal, for example, is um, flourishing if it can do what those what animals of that particular kind normally can do. So a dog that can't run or a child that's catatonic is not flourishing. Um, you may say, well, what about all the variability about um, dis disability and that sort of thing? Well, um, you take a deaf person, then they're not flourishing if they're not able to do or take advantage of things which are available to other deaf people or which could be available to them and is technologically possible and politically and socially possible. So it, you know, it's post structurists are always ready to jump in and say this is normalizing, you know, and, uh, and um, can't deal with difference. Well, it, I think it can actually, um, but it's a, that's a naturalistic view of, of um, as the title said, goodness, of flourishing, of well-being. And um, so, so violence impairs well-being, but it's that impairment can happen in so many different ways. You may we may be worried about devaluing the concept of violence by overusing it, overstretching it, perhaps. Sure. Well, think of another word, um, but don't pretend that it, it's not evaluative and equally that it, it can't also be um, you know, fairly sound empirical claim. I don't know whether that helps. Or not, but... um, I was wondering, you know, I'm a PhD student, so my question might be quite naive, Andrew, but when you're looking to reduce determined absences, you know, absence the absence, and to, you know, get rid of unnecessary suffering and, 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 and encourage flourishing, is there, is there a limit on that? And how do you know that? And how do you approach that? So when we're talking about, you know, a person's starving, um, so, you know, the absence is food, that's great. So, you know, if we do some analysis, find the findings, we get the price of food, they can be well nourished. But if we do it too much, they can become obese and that can cause suffering. Is there a kind of, how do you limit that? And how do you know that you kind of reach the optimal level? That might be a very stupid question, but it just made me well, think about that. Um, if somebody has an eating disorder, they can't do the things which a person normally can do. Um, so, you know, and Aristotle talked about this in terms of the mean. There can be an excess of something when something which is a virtue or, or a good thing um, can um, be becomes problematic if there's an excess of it, and that one has to balance different things out in life. So, uh, put it in a crass version: the work-life balance, for example. So how do we balance the various needs and goods and demands upon us? And that's a kind of practical judgment. And um, as I mean, as a regard, you know, I don't know whether you've looked at the capabilities approach. I don't know whether, is that used in criminology? And this comes from Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, most notably. And this, particularly with Martha Nussbaum, says, well, there are certain things which must be available to everyone, like freedom from violence, access to food, and being able to participate in the community. And it's put that way, not, not necessarily, not, it's not that you have to do these things, but they should be available to you. You may choose to fast, um, but that's different from starving because you've made a choice. So it respects people's autonomy to make judgments about what they think is good or bad. But it, she has, tw I think it's 12 different kinds of things which people must have to flourish. 
and um, that's been um, heavily criticised as um, uni universalist, um, to which my response is, yeah, in what, yeah, but what's the problem? Um, if it, if it, if it's not, if it shouldn't be universalist, universal, or if it isn't universal, then tell me where it, where, what it's missing. Um, so people are trying to um, put together some culture-wide um, set of ideas about what uh, constitutes flourishing. And um, provided it is kept open for discussion, it's not imposed upon people, then you know, I think it's a good thing. To, we should, So uh -huh. yeah, to participate in the life of the community is one of Martha Nussbaum's capabilities. And um, so in that case, I just mentioned uh, uh, women who marry and then find that they can't participate in the life of the community, that they're not allowed to go out um, effectively under house arrest. Um, that's an that's a example of an app of a denial of a capability. And so that's, I think she would say, well, that's a form of suffering or denial of flourishing. And I, I, I suppose then, uh, Andrew, that there is, I mean, I mean it, were, were those kind of real negative lack of capabilities, but on a base level, there has to be a kind of, you have a sense of freedom if you if you if you adopt the capabilities approach, but because we adopted the capabilities approach, that would impinge on some of our freedoms. Would that be correct? Well, yeah. I mean, the freedom to um, attack other people violently <laughs> that that that's implicitly denied. Yeah, yeah. It's but if I if we all wanted to, you know. For our is a, a scarce resource, I mean, a proof crop commodity, but we can't all afford Ferraris. So, you know, there can, if there's only, a, I mean, that's a bit of a bad example, but if we're saying there's a limited amount of food that we, we, some people might want to eat until they're sick, but they couldn't do that. They can, yeah. you know, we would have to, in a kind of a, sort of a socialism, have to divide that out so that you've oh. got the freedom because you're part of this network, which is all adopt into a capabilities approach, but you've then also got a slight unfreedom because you, you haven't got carte blanche just to do what you want. Yeah. Um, sorry, just, just I'm in a senior moment. <laughs> but um, can you just say the last bit again, please? Yeah, no problem. I'm not explaining myself very clearly, but with a capabilities approach, I, yeah, I, just rem I remembered it now. Okay. Yeah. So, I think if you look at the capabilities list, they're they're not terribly demanding in terms of um, le levels of economic development. Um, quite, and they're attainable at quite low levels of development. I think that does imply much greater equality than we have in many societies. Yes, and one of the deficiencies of the capabilities approach is that um, it's very much the province of philosophers and social policy people. Um, and it's somewhat divorced, or totally divorced in some cases, from analyses of the mechanisms which determine what's available to people. And so it's a kind of wish list of good things, you know, that you can sign up to um, without threatening anything. <laughs> because it's not actually identifying what's blocking people from getting um, these capabilities. And it may be interpersonal things like interpersonal violence, or it may be structural things like um, the um, ownership of property, the distribution of property. So. Or, or I think, Andrew, I'm, I'm perhaps even in the context of contemporary criminology, even more controversially, group-based violence. So, um, uh, uh, without wishing to, to, to put 
Rachel on the spot here, but I had the privilege of um, supervising her PhD as well, which is on uh, women's safety in the nighttime economy, um, uh, in which um, uh, women who self-identified as locals, uh, um, we might say um, working class communities and so on, had a certain culture of alcohol consumption and uh, related into personal violence. So that was very much a group based, yeah. But to sort of talk about, you know, white working class women from the valleys as being drunken and violent uh, would immediately get the hackles up of a lot of uh, critical criminologists for, um, uh, for if you like, buying into a kind of uh, criminalisation um, uh, discrimination against that group. Yeah, and that's that's the problem. So, you know, it's how I, I think, that, you know, the more challenging aspects around um normative categories evaluative categories of uh, how people be uh, uh, behave uh, is 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 around criminalization is criminalization at, at all uh, uh, justified in those terms on those grounds yeah. um and what sort of evaluative criteria might one bring to bear to to to, to justify that our colleague uh, who, who regrettably can't be with us after all this evening uh, Gordon Hughes um just written a book called crime violence and modernity uh, heavily influenced by uh, your thinking, Andrew. It's, it's a great shame that he, he he can't be here to discuss this as well. But in that, he is taking a lot of pot shots, if you like, at uh, sort of uh, mainstream thinking, you know, in terms of uh, critical criminology uh, about uh, how we think about violence amongst groups, uh, uh, amongst other, you know, street violence and so on, uh, where he's arguing that uh, there is a certain uh, squeamishness in critical social science, if we go anywhere near that, for fear of being playing into sort of tabloid narratives uh, around uh, ethnic minorities, around sort of working class lads, or, you know, a, a tendency as a consequence to, to move away, if you like, from street violence, even though that is a kind of major concern uh, uh, in our democracy, yeah? a, a perfectly legitimate public issue. Where is the language to explain the causes of that kind of violence in, 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 in group terms? And how might we be able to use concepts of flourishing or increasingly suffering, okay, to make sense of um, that kind of violence and 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 use those sorts of categories? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that would be regarded as incredibly provocative in a lot of places. Okay, um, uh, I think, and I don't know, Rachel or, uh, or or the British criminologists, whether you 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 would agree. Um, we had a launch of. Um, Sorry, Rachel, come in. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I was thinking a lot while Andrew and the rest of you were talking more about the sex work research, but you're absolutely right. Um, I read um, Andrew's book while I was doing my PhD and it helped me navigate some really complex, and I, and I will fully admit I was an absolute wimp about the possibility of being the person, because of course you didn't, I thought I was terribly important, um, that said that working class women are violent, um, but couched in terms of understanding from their point of view, why sticking up for themselves, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, um, but why it was important to them, and it was about pride and their geopolitical histories and their allegiance to place and each other, and that actually, but sorry, I'm rambling, but I think to refer back to what Adam was saying, what I found so interesting at the time was that there are a whole load of other constructs that have been built around it to explain working class women's participation in violence. So it must be about the music. It must be about the venues. It wasn't anything to do with any of those things. They could have been anywhere and they would have done it. But it was that kind of, you know, let's let's kind of dress it up as something else that other people will find more palatable than to just point out what it was, but not in a, um, of course, they're also terribly common and stupid and violent, but just in a trying to understand why it made sense to them. And I think that's what how, why I found your book and still find it really useful is trying to understand why it was important to for their flourishing weirdly um to engage but anyway i'll shut up i said i wasn't going to speak thanks adam you made me speak <laughs> we'll be regretting that roundabout now um but yes thank you i well, found it really useful i'm now definitely going to shut up <laughs>
Can I butt in there? I mean, I remember um, this when I was teaching an MA course, we covered some of these subjects that, and I said, well, um, cultures aren't necessarily good. And I could see this sharp intake of breath from certain quarters, you know. And, you know, I said, well, it's quite easy to get, get them to come round and say, well, is a misogynist culture as good as a non-sexist culture, you know, as Germany now better or worse than Germany in the 1930s and 40s, you know. It's, yeah, cultures aren't necessarily good. I th it is very common um, to have an idealized view of the dominated. And domination is not ennobling. It doesn't, it, da it, it can damage people. Deprivation can damage people so that they behave in antisocial ways, you know, not necessarily in only, you know, only minority of people who are um, various ways disadvantaged um, engage in, in what you might call antisocial behavior. Um, but you've got to think about different audiences. Yes, um, you can imagine some of this feeding into tabloid, um, you know, benefit street kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I discussed that in my book, Moral Significance of Class. Towards the end of that book, I finally confront this issue, how, you know, how it affects um, people. And again, I've been, I was influenced strongly by Martha Nussbaum. And um, she talks about the book uh, Grapes of Wrath, about these people traveling across to the west coast of America, enduring all these hardships. Um, but there's a conceit in the book, which is that it doesn't do them any harm to their moral qualities. They're such wonderful people helping each other. But that's quite unlikely in, in, in reality that they're not going to turn on each other in some cases at least so yeah i mean cultures can be oppressive and, and repressive and that can have bad effects on people but it's it's always going to be very highly differentiated according to the particularities of individuals and their upbringing and, and so on especially their early early years, you know. So, yes, I mean, this is why I think you know, that Andrew's work is, is really useful for us in, 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 in that context. When we want to talk as engaging arguments public arguments as well about crime which is often couched in group terms in subcultural cultural terms yeah um there is the danger of being unwittingly enrolled into some tabloid um uh, uh, uh agenda about that um and that's partly what drives a lot of the um avoidance intellectual avoidance techniques which Rachel was just talking about yeah. um uh but in do in 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 not wanting to avoid the problem <laughs> um uh what is the language that we can use towards to to, to make to make make sense sense of that you know, to talk about the causes of victimization uh offending um uh, 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 in uh, in in sociological terms, without well, without... why in sociological terms? I mean, I noticed that in the, in the email circular. Yeah. That, I mean, I I have I'm allergic to disciplines and their boundaries. Um, I know I'm in the sociology department, but I have to find somewhere to uh, to, to locate. <laughs> and um, you know, they're very open, and they never restricted me. Um, but well, it, 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 I meant Andrew in terms of the you know. Uh, Social categories of class and ethnicity, gender. Well, that, yeah, but there's also psychological things, you know, to do with, especially the early years, the formation of attachments or failure to form attachments, the terrible effects of neglect, and you know, neglect more than abuse apparently, on those early years, which can um, 
you know, affect people for decades, if not whole lifetimes. And there's a lot of interesting social research by psychologists and neuroscientists on that. And um, you know, the trouble with disciplines like sociology, they want to bring everything as much as possible under their umbrella of their own favorite tropes and concepts. But um, I mean, the, the divisions and hostility between sociology and psychology are absurd. They should be, they should have a way of talking to each other. Both would have to change, I think. Why does sociology neglect the most important years of socialization, which are the, the early years? This, this is supposed to be its, its big thing, socialization. Well, it's ignoring the most important years in terms of influencing how people behave. As individuals, okay, there's social structures as well, which are ignored by psychologists, but follow the connections where they lead, I'd say, forget disciplines. And, and, and again, that is, I think, um, very much a moot point in, in contemporary criminological argument between the context or the composition of offending and victimization. So we might say then that um, patterns of violence, um, interpersonal violence, street-based violence, tends to occur in neighbourhoods characterised also by other indices of multiple deprivation. This would be the sociological point about the textual port important of, of understanding violence and not being pulled into too um, aggressive uh, kind of methodological individualism from some of the psychologists, because that's, that's another kind of key fissure in, in contemporary criminology. A certain uh, influence at Cambridge, for example, some arguing that pathways into and out of offending behaviour are are, um, are about individualized risk. Yeah, a lot of the points that Andrew was was talking about um, adverse childhood experiences, which are experienced on an individual basis, of coming together a whole set of uh, uh, around a particular biography, and the uh, and so the pathways out of that need to be understood in that way, yeah. uh, and and that really social categories of class or gender ethnicity really have no role or in a sense kind of moribund in trying to make sense of that composition. Of, uh, of 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 a problem like 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 violence, okay, um, but but to, and to be fair to that argument, then that even in some of the higher um, higher crime, higher risk neighbourhoods of that violence, the the uh, the prevalence of the violence is not that great. This is the kind of key argument, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 um, uh, uh, the actual fact that the, the overwhelming majority. Uh, of young males from certain ethnic minority backgrounds are not involved and don't get anywhere near weaponized violence, even in you know uh, those neighbourhoods and some big English cities uh, where 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 you know it's uh, the incidence is higher, yeah, but the prevalence is still low, and, uh, and that is the important is trying to uh, navigate our way between um, composition and context. And then that is another way of thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, absolutely. I, I didn't want to come across as um, um, sociologically imperialist <laughs> at all. I just mean, I just got to, it's interesting, you know, how kind of, in one sense, isn't it, isn't it fascinating that when we can talk about individualised risk is, is far less problematic in terms of explaining violence and that's it's far less incendiary than using the kind of language that Rachel was, uh, you know, uh, in relation to some, some of her own subjects and how they spoke, spoke about themselves and their experience of alcohol and violence in the nighttime economy. Yeah? Who is that? Yeah. Rachel, uh, who just spoke earlier, her, her PhD. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about oh, women's no, safety no. in the nighttime economy, Andrew. So of, of, of uh, white working class women from the valleys talking about themselves as white working class women in the valleys and the, right. and, and the kind of yeah. culture of alcohol use and defense of yeah so they they don't have any problem about 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 you know using those those categories to 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 account for what's going on um we, we as critical social scientists that be a bit more squeamish about colluding in that it's kind of interesting about yeah. that authenticity and so on and use of that. And it, i did come across an interesting discussion about the um high of rates of offenders um, from people who have been in foster care. And on the one hand, there's the damage done by um, lack of attachment in an early early life, failures of former attachments and to be looked after adequately. On the other hand, there's the failures of the foster care system itself 
which certainly certainly doesn't help. And um, you know, being left adrift at eighteen or whatever it is to fend for themselves. So, I mean, that's an interesting debate about how these two kinds of um, one the social context in which they're brought up and, and the other the early years psychological more psychological damage and so on uh, but so but this we share you see uh, uh, a kind of realist problematic of wanting to explain <laughs> the yeah. of behavior whereas you see just to put that into uh, andrew it's it, it, it's it's uh, the inclination the legacy of the new deviancy theory would say well you you, you can't post questions about causation that is immediately to buy into discriminatory correctional vocabulary and language. Uh, uh, the point is, is to is to deconstruct that, to reveal the uh, contestations around what constitutes violence and how it's better explained anyway, and and, and when it's more kind of extreme post-structuralist versions, just to uh, 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 document these rival truth regimes or truth claims. You see, whereas I think what I've found you know compelling about your work. Uh, and about the critical realist approach, there's a sort of courage, really, to such to row back from that and say, well, nonetheless, <laughs> the causal explanation remains important for the avoidance of suffering, yeah, for proper emancipation, yeah, and that is uh, really where we're trying to locate. Well, we, where well, I'm interested in locating the uh, critical realist uh, influence yeah. in contemporary criminological thought is a way of navigating between that. The legacy of the of the of, of the new deviancy theory, deconstruction uh, regarding problems of violence, especially as only social constructs. Yeah, on the yeah. one hand, but then I've, stepping back from the, you know, some of the cruder um, positivist uh, attempts to isolate the independent variable, explaining what causes this. Right, you know, it seems to me what we what we're developing there is an altogether more subtle, nuanced. Mm -hmm. concrete analysis of uh mm -hmm. of crime, but which also has these normative dimensions to them you know and that's the interesting really i think the really the key point coming back to the book with this question there is that the the normative categories themselves are are are, 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 are um a determination part of the unity of diverse determinations of explaining um, yeah. the prevalence of violence in a high crime area uh as in london for example has been quite low yeah but um, it's and it's a number of different levels. It's in thinking of the the case of uh, young offenders who've been in care. I mean, it, it's social, cult, social and cultural, psychological and neurological as well. Yeah. You know, and it's, we have to find out how these what are the feedbacks between these different levels, and what can change and what can't. What is easy to change? What's difficult to change? And that one must do that to avoid continued suffering, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and to engage in how we nonetheless could could lead to a situation where people could flourish rather than be subject to these forms of violence. Because ultimately, that is what we do. I suppose the really you know, provocative claim uh, is that the new deviancy theory is inhibiting flourishing, is is even reproducing suffering. How about that? Okay, is reproducing suffering because it is not helping us develop the kind of ecological account of how such suffering could be reduced or attenuated. It's just shifting instead uh, the argument about what the uh, the priorities and the uh, the appropriate um, uh, research question is. Yeah. Fred, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with new de deviancy theory, so you got a one-sentence explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Uh, the, 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 well, okay, so the idea of uh, the new DBC theory as it came about in the late 60s was to say that uh, 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 one sort of must switch the um, direction of causal explanation. It's not that uh, uh, one explains offending behaviour and how uh, authorities more or less um, uh, 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 effectively respond to it, but rather it is the authorities who create the problem? Yeah. They define as they, 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 they. I mean, what was central to this was the idea of crime as a label, a labeling theory. So I label you as a, yeah, uh, a social person. Uh, uh, and, uh, can compatible with post structuralism to me. Yeah. 
Yes, it is. Well, it's, that would be, that would be the adoption that. of radical social constructivism within criminology, essentially, is what we should have probably said at the start to define new new deviancy theory. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I promised I wouldn't do dominate this session as well. Okay, so come on. <laughs> I had my go last time. <laughs> Uh, well, if I can naively offer, um, you, you were criticising Bauman's instrumental rationality in the book, Andrew, and, um, and, and talking about formative, the difference between formative rationality and, and instrumental rationality. I got a little bit lost on that, I'll be honest. Could you clarify that for me at all? Okay. Um, instrumental well, a lot of critical theorists, Bauman included, um, have identified so as a major ill of um, modernity is the dominance of instrumental reason. And Bauman's example was the Holocaust and those who, who got um, drawn into it as functionaries. Um, they were performing the instrumental rationality to make um, the concentration camps and so on work. And that their whole view of the world was just instrumental, do your job, never mind what the ends are. And um, one of the features of moderna modernity, as Weber argued, was um, rationalization. And one theme, one aspect of it was increasing power of instrumental reason, technology, for example, in bureaucracy. Yeah, but um, we can't get away from instrumental reason. We all need it. We all got to work out how we're going to do things. And okay, we want to do them in a way which is consistent with our ends, which is fairly easy on an individual level, but harder when you're in part of an international division of labor or something like that. <laughs> Um, what is what I was particularly concerned with was formal rationality, the kind that's used in randomized um, experimental design, you know, which has a function and, you know, would not would never dismiss it. But um, it cuts out uh, as, as if it was somehow primitive any kind of practical rationality where you attend to the specificities of individual individuals or, or particular groups. What is it about that group in the Southwest Valleys? What is it about this individual so-called offender and their situation? And how far can that account for what they did? did? And that's a kind of practical reasoning it's about well, partly it can be informed by theory as well, but when you're listening to someone in, inter in an interview and um, reading over the transcripts and something like that, um, a lot of it, well, that's interpretive analysis, if you like. Um, but um, it, it's not, you, you can try and you can use various software to try and formalize the process of interpretation, but you also draw upon, if you're sensible, you draw upon everything you know from personal experience, from what you've learned in academia and so on to make sense, to try and make sense of what this person is telling you, what they've done and so on. And so formal rationality, typically using statistics or maths has a lot of limitations there tends to assume a kind of ontology of individual specimens, because that's, I mean, a lot of statistics was developed in the context of horticulture and agriculture, you know, where you have different specimens, you give them different treatments and see what happens. Um, but when you're talking about people, um, that doesn't make much, much sense. It would be a bit like saying, um, let's take a representative sample of someone's body. Oh, well, here we've got a bit of liver. Here we've got a bit of lung. Are these representative? Well, it doesn't make any sense at all. What you want to know is how they function together. And 
you don't need necessarily to see thousands of livers to know how, how they work. You need to follow the causal connections. Um, I think I'm getting off the topic here, but no, I was very interested, but because but, obviously you talk about fellow feeling in your book, and I, I've just done 84 interviews. I was a police officer for 19 years, so I have got that fellow feeling to not just listen to what these police officers are saying in their, in their interviews, but to really get a kind of sense, an inner sense of what they're, you know, what is it like ontologically being a police officer ra rather than when I'm coming across a lot of work on police culture, it, it can lend itself to almost an instrumental uh, portrayal of, of what it's like being a cop. Um, so fellow feeling, you know I mean, that really resonated, especially since, you know, officers who maybe join the job, they're committed, invested, it's why it's called the job. You know, when it goes wrong for them, it can be such a detrimental breakdown because their whole ideology, the whole world just crumbles and everything they know it just breaks so I, I found it really really interesting and, and but thank you for explaining that it, it just one last question does that then link because obviously with Bam when he talks about the garden state does that link into ideology then with with that what, so that so uh, repeat the last bit for me yeah please. so going back to to because going back to Bauman's work he talks about instrumental rationality the fact that then with the, the holocaust you know you have capitalism and you have instrumental rationality which meant the individuals were number one individual was responsible for for that carnage and horrible thing you know um it was incremental but you, behind that you had an ideology you know it talks about the garden and state you know they, they had a particular particular view and anything that didn't fit in that particular view was a, a was being the weed so you kind of got instrumental rationally but have you do you think you've got an ideology running in the background you also need to for me as a researcher kind of tune into yeah, and um, the first part of your question, it just struck me that um, one thing I, I was impressed with um, was a book by Arlie Russell Hushchild, the American um, sociologist, and um, a book called Strangers in Their Own Land, which is about Tea Party members in the US, where she went and lived with some um, Tea Party members in Louisiana, the most polluted and one of the poorest parts of the US, and tried to understand where they were coming from in a very open way. And one technique she used on them after she listened to them and um, gone to, done lots of participant observation of them at social gatherings and various contexts was to ask them if, well, construct what she thought was the deep story what was implicit in their resentments. And in that case, it was feeling that others were jumping the queue, that they'd been waiting in line um, for improvement in their lives, but others were cutting in, especially the educated classes and so on. And that when she told them, they showed them this deep story, they all said, that's exactly it, yeah. So, you know, that was quite interesting, I thought. Bauman, coming back to Bauman and formal rationality. Well, actually, it's treat, you know, one of the things that happened in the Holocaust was treating people as numbers yeah. um, and not as individual person, people with feelings and so on. Um, that's formal rational, formal rationality. You you um, categorize, you know, boil everything down into discrete categories. And you deal with, with them as a member of the category rather than as a you know, sentient being. Yeah. Okay. So, so I would say there is the formal aspect of it, which is can be so damaging if it's used out of place, or if it's used on its own without anything else to counterbalance it. And I, I can see that within police and when, you know, you, we wear a collar number for a start, you know, so that formal rationality starts the day you, the day you yeah. join. And obviously, when, you know, when that is warranted, it's fine when you, when you need to be treated on it in, in, in a formal capacity, but you are essentially a human being behind that and you need to be yeah. listened to, you know, things you talk about and shame, dignity in your book, that needs to be adhered to so they can flourish. Mm -hmm.
Um, thank you, thank you for that. Has anybody else got any questions? I'm, I'm wary of the, the time we've, we've been sort of cooking on, running for about over an hour and 10 minutes now. But anybody like to ask uh, Andrew a question? Or each other. <laughs> <laughs> or, or yes, or each other. Yes, well, what do you think? Just to say, Andrew, uh, I, I've gained so much out of your work over the years. Thanks. Lovely to, to see you. I, I, if you're interested, <laughs> um, in the inaugural session we had last month of this, of this, Nick, I gave a bit of an open lecture um, where I was using all the work you did on chaotic concepts, which was just fantastic. And, and a lot of our PhD students have drawn upon that as well. And it seems to me that contemporary criminology really is a history of chaotic concepts and bad abstractions. Uh, um, but uh, the one response to which has been, as you'll, you'll have gathered from my contributions this evening, my bugbear, from the um, social constructionists um, through to the post-structuralists, uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, walk away from causal explanation rather than uh, reconstruct uh, etiology in uh, in contemporary criminology around better. Um, abstractions which aren't chaotic and what can that mean and I think your work and critical realism has a lot to to, to add to that and so I think uh, contemporary criminology certainly in, 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 in the UK is a story of the so-called etiological crisis you know the, the, the attempt to try and explain offending behaviour and victimisation running into all sorts of uh, cul-de-sacs and problems Precisely because of the use of formal relations of similarity and difference and an attempt to, 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 to build um, causal explanation on those grounds, rather than substantive relations of necessary uh, and contingent connection. And uh, stated like that is also as rather kind of pat, doesn't it? You know, but I mean, I think trying to elaborate that, I think, is a, is a really good project for us. Yeah is the renaissance, the retrieval of causal explanation. We should not be scared of etiology. You know, we should embrace it. But as critical realists, we've got a more subtle take on how to explain things. Uh, and, and Andrew's latter work gives us a good sense of, you know, really the, the compulsion to do that in order to avoid suffering and to to, to drive flourishing. You know, um, that's, that's, that's what's critical about our kind of realism. So um, uh, just as a way of, Andrew trying to put a tape uh, and for the colleagues uh, locate, you know, uh, your work uh, into our current concerns around uh, retrieving uh, etiology as uh, an appropriate, indeed, vital aim of contemporary criminology explanation. So thank you. Um, I'd be interested if you ever get the chance to listen to that. <laughs> uh, that I haven't done too much damage to your ideas, I hope, but, uh, but we've certainly been very useful um, for my thinking, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's very, very kind. And it's good to know that it's happening. Um, perhaps it's because and I um, have avoided trying to fit into a particular discipline, but um, get, I'm often quite surprised by who takes up these ideas. Um, actually, it's not so much sociologists generally. <laughs> There's people in other disciplines, but anyway, other other areas. Thank you. I th I thank you ever so much for taking the time to join us, Andrew. You're always right. welcome. Always okay. welcome. Okay. I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll leave now, and then you can talk amongst yourselves. No, 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 no. We we think we wrap it up anyway. But uh, you're always always welcome to to join us, and and, and thank you. For, for okay. Time. All the best. Good luck. Thank you.